I'm Dr. Eric Lee. I'm from Utah, a chiropractic physician. And today we get Dr. John Edwards, a neurosurgeon out of Utah as well, and Nina Bradley with Sentinel Spine. And thanks for coming on and being with us today. Um, we had a conversation earlier um, about the use of different devices in spine surgery, Dr. Edwards. And when you're planning a surgery or looking at different types of cases that you have, what what's some of your processes that you might go into, Might your thought process and thinking which device you may use or if it's going to be a fusion or um, just that whole parameter of what type of cases you would see that you would use those devices? I think the patient goals come into play. What is the patient trying to accomplish with the surgical intervention? What the pathology shows, is there a need for stabilization? Is there a need for decompression? And how can we achieve the, the functional outcome for the patient to allow them to achieve their goals? I think it's there's a lot of uh, experience, uh, personal experience that the surgeon has that plays into it. And there's experience that the team has with a particular device. So that plays a role as well. Hmm. Um, when you said about being more active or their goals, is it, if they're very, if there's some uh, patients that's very active in sports or different variety of different things, does that really come into play? I'm like, is there a lot of people that come in and say, Hey, I want to do this more and I want to still be able to continue to golf or I still want to do this. Does that factor in? Yes. And I think the message for patients is that in most cases, they should not be afraid of discontinuing the things that they love. I think that with a team like we have here at the table working well together we can help them achieve their goals in an interdisciplinary way. And what's really neat about the conversation we had is the technology on the industry side has been around a long time on the one hand and has also become increasingly better on the other hand. And then the surgeon experience has grown around the country. My own experience has grown significantly. And then when you supplement that with really this idea of a, a spine management provider guiding uh, the patient through the process and adding tremendous value before surgery and after surgery, then I think we can achieve uh, outcomes we've never achieved before. Patients can return to basically any activity that they were previously engaged in and should not be afraid that they can't go and do the things they love. I, I know from a from a spine management perspective in chiropractic, I'm looking always to see how the mobility of the best mobility I can get from the spine. And, and that's why Nina, I really like motion preservation. I'm going to try to come in looking at a patient, how much motion we can preserve. Cause, um, sometimes we, I think a lot of clinicians look at, well, we have measurements of ranges of motion and they're very regional. Mm -hmm. We always try to achieve a certain degree of range of motion in the cervical spine. And so we know that's a really important part of preserving motion. So when, when there's a patient or from the device company, what, what technology is there that they can kind of say or use uh, to help, I don't know, get the question be getting better results and preserving the, that type of motion. What, what is something that goes into like a device company's thought process of trying to preserve that? That's a great question. And I wanted to segue just briefly on what Dr. Edwards was just mentioning. You know, we do tend to focus in this industry and certainly what we do as, an, as a company is um, build devices that assist in motion preservation. But if you kind of back out of that a little bit, you know, I think we would all agree that motion is life, right? So whether I'm a patient that says, I want to get back to competitive gymnastics, as you were referencing in um, an earlier discussion, or I am a 65 year old patient that really wants to make sure that I can continue to garden or get out of bed comfortably. I think we can all agree that each of those patients, while they have very different um, uh, biomechanical demands and, and, and activity demands, 
all want and, and, you know, maybe even deserve, if we use that word carefully, the ability, if appropriately um, diagnosed and it's appropriate for their condition to have the opportunity to maintain right. motion. And so I really think of it from a corporate perspective. What we look at is, you know, in the absence of um, abject deformity or um, gross instability, if retaining motion is an option in that patient's surgical or operative level, then we want to provide a device that will do that safely and effectively. And so um, motion preservation devices or artificial disc replacements mm -hmm. of the spine are um, rigorously tested um, over a number of years, typically five, six, seven years um, in pre-FDA approval testing. They are they must um, provide stability. Uh, they must provide a mechanism to have um, longevity and quality motion over a significant period of time. Right, This is not a device that we're going to ask a surgeon to place into the spine and know that it's going to be irrelevant in two to three years. Mm. This device may need to be relevant, in fact, likely will need to be relevant in 10, 20, potentially 30 years for this patient. Um, and so we have to create um, a device with high quality materials. We have to um, create a device that will um, resist shear forces, um, um, manage any sort of debris or or just use uh, long-term use and have to be quality um, and 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 really have the longevity to last it must stabilize the spine it must allow the patient to move it must do what the surgeon creates the right. pathway for it to do and I think that as a device company is what we are um, just fiercely dedicated to these are not short-term devices these are um, long-term devices for a patient and that will allow them to have a more normal function and a more normal quality of life down the road. Dr. Edwards, how, what have you seen over the last, I don't know, five to 10 years since you've been in practice, the outcomes of you, if when you started looking at patients, have things changed as you started different or looking at your approaches with patient care? Yes, so let's just take the cervical spine for example. The outcomes with cervical disc replacement are better than the outcomes with cervical fusion. And another evolution has been that we are more aggressive, and aggressive is maybe the wrong word, but patients that we used to think needed a fusion because of significant arthritic component to their disease as opposed to somebody that had minimal arthritis and a large disc herniation. We are historically maybe would have done a fusion there, but we are doing disc replacement now and the outcomes are better. To echo what Nino, Nina said, the uh, cervical uh, artificial disc devices have been rigorously studied and are the most studied devices in all of spine, the most uh, rigorously investigated surgical interventions. So for somebody to say it's experimental or we don't have long-term information about these implants, that would be a misconception, I think, at this point. And That's I'm, a good point. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people don't, even me as a clinician, didn't realize that longevity. you can get the longevity mm -hmm. from a biomechanical standpoint trying to manage this patient over that time frame after surgery that's really important right for the, us to go into the, the thing that. that you and i have seen uh, especially in our practice lately is we've we've gone from saying that you need a fusion to saying disc replacement's an option to saying disc replacement is the superior option over time mm -hmm. and now we're seeing increasingly better outcomes with expert pre and post chiropractic and spine management that mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Lee has been doing and patients that came after surgery to us in the early stages with some persistent complaints that historically have been normal persistent complaints are coming back and following up and we're finding less and less of those and better and better uh, outcomes from that, which I think is, is so exciting. Yeah. I think one thing that I've seen working with you over the last several years, um, before early on in my career, I would try to do everything possible to prevent any type of surgery and working 
with you in the technology that's there now. I know that I can, with the outcomes I can get after a dish replacement may be completed. And sometimes I maybe you push in that the patient get that quicker, but it's not to just because I know they've been suffering for so long and I know there's a, an outcome that we can achieve and get the long-term benefits from that. Um, that's well, good, I was going to say, exciting. even with a well-done fusion, right? It, it's not even so much a device specific, but really the holistic approach to um, quality pre and post care. If a patient does have to yep. have surgery, a quality surgical operation, a quality device, no matter what direction that patient's um, indications take them. And then again, quality post-operative management to continue a holistic um, care pathway for that patient is what I really mm -hmm. see you guys work together very well doing. I was just going to say, coming back to the patient's goals, I think that guides a lot of the timing of treatment. If a patient is managing a a condition and they're able to do their job, they're able to do the things they love and their their management strategy is working for them. That's one thing. If they are unable to do their job appropriately or they cannot do the things they love to do or they're constantly distracted or up at night because of the pain, mm -hmm. those kinds of things, the, the idea that uh, surgery is this last resort and you've got to be bedridden and, and the symptoms have to be so bad mm -hmm. before you even go there, I think needs to be thought about differently. It's got to be, well, what is you, what are you trying to accomplish here? Yeah. What is your objective? What is your goal? How can we put a team of providers around you with an interdisciplinary approach to achieve that goal? What does that care plan look like? And that makes some of the surgical decision making a little bit more straightforward. It's nice now. A lot of times I have to debunk the past surgical outcomes. Mm -hmm. So somebody's had an aunt or an uncle that's had a grandmother or a neighbor oh, that says, mm -hmm. you know, I can't do surgery or I'll be a cripple or, mm -hmm. you know, and, and it's fun actually to kind of educate and show some of these minimally invasive approaches mm -hmm. that this is what we're trying to preserve. Mm -hmm. And when they start seeing that, it's um, night and day mm -hmm. changes for their comments sometimes to see. You know, we've learned a lot from past experience, both our own experience and others. Uh, the, the, the surgeries need to be technically performed well. We have better technology in the operating room to avoid complications. The devices are better. And then an interdisciplinary approach, the avoidance of narcotics uh, and a variety of other factors, I think our outcomes in spine generally are much, much better than they used to be 10, 20, 30 years ago. And some of the horror stories that are out there um, are, are increasingly less common. It's just what people know and have heard. And so I think taking the time to, to spend, to, to help the patient again, refocus on what it is you're trying to accomplish, what we think would be helpful for them, what our experience is, what the current state of the medical device industry is like and the technology is like. Uh, not so much a, a fear-based approach, which is uh, somebody, somebody, something, or something somebody heard from in the past. Don't you think that's kind of part and parcel of having the process of managing? It, instead of saying you get as bad as you can possibly get as a patient, and then when it's I can't get out of bed or I'm I'm suffering so horrifically mm -hmm. that then I have whatever surgical approach is left. You yeah. know, to sort of fix as best they can versus an integrative approach with your caregivers that you know that this is a process of management. As you mentioned, diabetes management or heart mm -hmm. disease management, you have a condition. We are going to manage it in a series of ways. Some time in there might include surgery, mm -hmm. but that is not that does not have to be the end. Mm -hmm. That right. can be somewhere right. else that fits. Is that mm -hmm. kind of Def jive? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's interesting to see that how it evolves. There's lots of treatment mm -hmm. uh, modalities, procedures. I think we, we tend to run into these type of treatment modalities. Uh, if you have this pain, you go get this. And I think we've over the last couple of years have really tried to put together something we'll say we need to really find out the the cause and the root of what's going on. And that word is coming up a lot. I see that in some different advertisements and people saying we find the root cause. And it's a little bit more complex than just finding the root cause. You you can definitely have a, a disc herniation that's uh, 
you know, a sequestered disc putting pressure on the nerve. And that is definitely a root cause of that. But there's so much surrounding pathology that can be contributing to that. Mm -hmm. And that we have to find as well, because it does help us in this whole management over a time. And people can have degenerative discs and be really asymptomatic. And that might be something we manage with certain um, home exercises and just monitoring what they're doing and help them. Um, and then they might get into a situation where they do need a surgeon and then they go right back into their quality of life and we continue to manage that aspect. I don't know too many people that get their teeth done and the dentist says, well, now that you have new teeth, you can stop yeah. brushing brush. them. Right. Yeah, it's fine. And, uh, <laughs> and so it's, it's, I think teeth analogies, people, Mm -hmm. understand it i mean you or you get your transmission changed and you don't change the oil periodically right. that's right, right. i mean right. you still have to you know you, you you brush your teeth and then you still have to go to the dentist to get them cleaned you know which is let, let me make one comment just to back up a bit on what a, a perioperative course looks like for a patient after a cervical disc replacement as an example uh the the surgeries are done as an outpatient uh, the surgery takes anywhere between less than an hour to maybe maybe less than two hours. It's not a particularly long surgery. The blood loss is minimal. Patient goes home a couple of hours after surgery in most situations. And then they are going back to their regular activities early on. There's not a period of bed rest or anything like that. So the surgery itself and the perioperative process can be minimally disruptive to their life. And I think with good counseling and a good game plan and, and a good team doing the surgery, the, the surgery itself can actually be, uh, be something that they do and then they just carry on with life. And, and, and so that's a very positive thing as well. I've seen, I think when I talk to patients prior to the surgery, they ask me, when will I be back to see you? I'm like, within a week, whenever you're mm -hmm. moving and I think they freak out thinking I'm going to manipulate this spine and we tend to forget that there's a lot of ways to mm -hmm. to manage this case and manage mobility and 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 beginning just really watching that and debunking a lot of these things like hey they'll come in I know and they'll be real easy on the table after two months and I'm like are you okay and like, I don't want to hurt my surgery and yeah. I, your, your surgery's good. It's okay. It's so where Nina comes in with the good devices. <laughs> you know, and the I mean, you've seen that over the technology over the years. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. That's one thing that I really, really like about disc replacements is because they're not so worried about a, maybe a screw getting broke or something that's rare, right. but, you know, still may happen. A little bit different too, I think, um, you know, the idea of a fusion takes a while to achieve, right? You're, if you're having a fusion procedure, even though the procedure is done excellently, the actual bone growth to create the completion of the fusion just takes some time, right? Six months a year, depending on various factors. Um, but with a disc replacement, you're not trying to achieve a fusion. And so there's no um, you know, within reason, there's no barrier to motion immediately because you're not, you, you want mm -hmm. that segment Mostly, moving yeah. as yeah. opposed to to the opposite and sometimes um, in our heads we you know i think patients certainly and potentially even some providers we forget to think about it that way one thing on so that's a good point you know and that is so john can you do dr ever sorry can you uh, describe more minimally invasive like that's a technique in surgery so a lot of people are used to having a big scar down their mm -hmm. back or, you know, this is what they've seen their aunt and uncle have or somebody or a big scar in the neck. Mm -hmm. So minimally invasive, uh, can you explain a little bit of that process? Well, I think it's the strategy to accomplish the goal of surgery, whether it's decompressing a nerve, implanting a device, doing a fusion, doing a disc replacement without disrupting the, the, the tissues much. Uh, I think a small incision is a part of it, but it's also what lies beneath. What are we doing with the muscle in particular? Mm -hmm. uh, traditional open surgical approaches would be like working in a cone where you have a big opening 
with a small target. And the reason you need a big opening to access a small target, especially if it's deep, is you have to get light instruments, your hands, all of that into that area. But if you have a way to have your target and your opening be the same and you're working in a cylinder uh, and the instruments are designed to get to the target without blocking your view, the light gets down there, the magnification that's needed, that would be a more minimally invasive approach. Uh, with cervical disc replacement, anterior cervical approaches are generally minimally invasive by nature. There's very little tissue disruption to make an incision in the skin and get down to the spine. And so by, by consequence, the recovery from that exposure is, is not much. Most of the recovery has to do with the changes in alteration in biomechanics, mm -hmm. the stretching of the disc space itself, and those kinds of things. Yes. Go ahead. I was just, it's interesting. I also like to think of now I've really shifted my thinking from just the term minimally invasive, which has kind of become a bit coined and mm -hmm. many, um, certainly consumers, I think as a potential patient, many patients don't necessarily know what that is. You don't yeah. know if that's the you know, a laser spine center somewhere, what exactly that means. But minimal tissue disruption is so key because it's the idea that you can achieve the same clinical outcome with much less disruption of the surrounding tissues. Would you agree? Yes. That's how I've began yeah. to really try to mm -hmm. think about it and talk about it. It's, a dif it's an interesting differentiation. And it goes along this line with achieving goals mm -hmm. and keeping the patients going, not not being disruptive, it's minimally disruptive to mm -hmm. the tissues, but it's also minimally disruptive to their life. Yes. These spinal problems are disruptive enough, let alone the treatments for them. So uh, I think that it all kind of fits and it's really, really satisfying to have a patient come in with a significant problem that it's disrupting their life and then have them get their life back and right back on track in a, in a timely manner without a, a lengthy recovery process. Yeah. I've had patients say, Dr. Lee, why? I've heard that I should go to Europe or Germany or someplace to get mm -hmm. this done because they're more advanced. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a direct question I've had. Mm -hmm. What would you tell that patient? I think that the center, the, the main center in Germany that does a lot of the disc replacement, especially in the lumbar spine, is excellent. Mm -hmm. that, that some of the most proficient surgeon or surgeons in the world are there. Uh, lumbar disc replacement is technically harder than cervical disc replacement. It requires a general surgeon or a vascular surgeon to do the approach versus uh, a cervical disc replacement. I can do the approach. So we're, uh, we do a lot of lumbar disc replacement, but it is a technically harder surgery. It is a little bit less available in different markets in the United States. Uh, on the flip side, I think that in, in a spine management model, you can stay connected with providers in your area. You can have the pre and post operative management done, the long-term management, the long-term follow-up. Most of the insurance companies now, and I, soon, I, I think soon all of the insurance companies will approve lumbar disc replacement, which historically was not the case. Mm -hmm. And then our surgical expertise is continuing to grow. Uh, I think Last month we did six lumbar disc replacements and they all went beautifully well. And we did many more cervical disc replacements than that. The indications for lumbar are a little bit more narrow. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely some great opportunities to go to Germany. It is expensive and it is kind of disruptive to go and spend mm -hmm. the time and come back. The outcomes are good. Uh, and one of the reasons why I've been getting involved more with lumbar disc replacements is to offer something to patients in our community so they don't feel like they have to go right. overseas. Yeah, I think it's very much an education piece, right? Mm -hmm. And when we talk about um, the advancements in minimally um, disruptive surgeries or, you know, all of these things are, are morphing over time. And there was a time in the United States where there were very few surgeons doing, you know, arguably cervical, certainly very few surgeons surgeons doing lumbar disc replacement and in many communities in fact broad communities patients did not have a lot of options mm -hmm. to go and get care more locally and so you know as a as a care provider as an industry as a you know as a patient as an advocate for emotion it's um you know 
education is key to, you know, your conversation mm -hmm. that helps that patient understand you can go to Germany and get an amazing outcome. And if that happens to fit into your travel plans for this year, fantastic. <laughs> but if it doesn't, yeah, right, yeah. then there's these amazing providers here five miles from your house mm -hmm. that will do the exact same. Um, right. And your insurance will cover that. I think that educational process is something we all take on every single day all across the United States. Mm -hmm. And I'm, you know, pleased to we're having this conversation, yeah. right? There's so much more available. It's not that Germany's not a magical option. Right. It's just that it certainly doesn't fit within everyone's purview or maybe even most people's purview to pick up and go overseas for several weeks to have a procedure. You no, know, that's a that's a great comment and and needs to be stressed. I try to stress that cuz I can certainly you can go to Germany and get that done, but that's a part of your care. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the long-term part in coordination with other providers and we're constantly talking about that i think that's more important um in the long scheme of things that's just my opinion but um i think it's a vital aspect because there's going to be that um care that you're gonna you might have to go back i mean so when you're constantly uh in connection with one another and, and i from a, a management provider can pick up the phone and speak with the physical therapist and the surgeons and everybody involved with that care, uh, the outcomes I believe are a lot better with that. But I do I did get that question, and so um, that was something I had to bring up. Um, well, it's funny because you know we already kind of touched and agreed on the fact that this is a disease state management, right? Mm -hmm. And so the same as we hope to have our patients not wait until there is simply nothing else to do but fuse right. your entire spine. It's kind of the same idea. You hope to not wait until there's nothing else to do but go to another country and have a wonderful procedure by wonderful surgeons where you have no support network back at your in, in, in your own community. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been fun. Yeah. Um, something I think we can continue to keep evolving and discussing, but having a chiropractic neurosurgeon and device companies all speaking, I think that's... Uh, hopefully it's in that hasn't uh, happened much has it? it doesn't happen very often it's really yeah. fun to be able to have these collegial conversations because yeah. you know every part is so valuable and valid yeah. but it's most effective when we work together yeah well. long term it just helps so much mm -hmm. and the quality of life for people we're starting to see you know they can do more and it's really exciting when you can take someone to say i can still go skiing or golfing or right. i'm like yeah yeah yeah. This is just a moment in time where you have to have that done. So thanks for being on with us today. That was great. Thank you for asking me All to right. join. Yeah.